Okay, good morning everybody. My name is Tiana DuPont with WCU Extension. I'm going to present this presentation on behalf of myself, Cody Molnar, um, and Ricardo Naranjo with WCU Extension, as well as Garrett Bishop with GS Long. We're going to talk a little bit about tree removal for X disease and little cherry virus. So the reason why we're talking about this is it's really important that we remove trees that are infected with X disease or little cherry disease. That's because these trees, the infection is throughout the tree. We might think like this tree here, that we only have an infection in one branch. You can see the picture on the left is that one very infected branch with the light colored fruit. However, that infection is throughout the tree. And so if we just remove one branch, we're still gonna have a source for the infection to move throughout that orchard as the insects feed on those trees. Two important things to remember with X disease and little cherry disease is that not only are they spread by grafting, they're also spread by insect vectors. And that that grafting is not only propagation, but also root grafting. So we can have movement from tree to tree down the orchard row when those tree roots grow together and are root grafted. So our general recommendations for tree removal have been to first scout and mark those suspect trees. And then if you I've already documented X disease or little cherry disease in the orchard. Go ahead and just take out those trees as long as the symptoms are obvious and you feel comfortable that indeed that's what the problem is in the block. If you haven't documented these pathogens in the block or in the area, then please sample those trees, send them into the lab, and document whether they're positive or not for X disease or little cherry, and then remove those positive trees. When you're doing your tree removal, there's a couple things to keep in mind. First of all, you wanna spray your insect vectors before you remove the trees. That's in order to um, make sure that the insects that then might be feeding on those trees don't just move to adjoining trees in the block. And then we suggest that you either use a glyphosate herbicide application when you remove the tree or test adjoining trees in order to see if you have non-symptomatic adjoining trees. Then you're gonna remove those adjacent trees with herbicide injury or um, with positive results. And if more than 20% of the block is infected, you probably wanna consider removing the whole block. So to explain this a little bit better, this is an example where you can see where a tree has been removed and you can see that the two adjoining trees have herbicide injury from when they applied glyphosate to that stump. Those two trees that look dead and brown um, were probably were root grafted to that tree that was removed. That means that if they were root grafted, the pathogen had already moved to those trees even though they weren't symptomatic and they need to be removed. So the herbicide is giving you an early warning so you can get ahead of this pathogen movement in the block. The herbicide is also killing those roots so that you have fewer living roots that adjoining trees could grow into root graft and become infected. For example, here you can see we have a block where they did that herbicide treatment when they did their tree removal and you have dead brown trees on um, one side of those removed trees. Those were trees that were infected with the pathogen, but they weren't symptomatic. And so by using this herbicide treatment, they were able to um, detect that early, get rid of those trees and hopefully slow the spread of the pathogen. But there's been a lot of questions about this tree removal process. What herbicide rates to use, what application method to use, what time of the year is best, and whether we really need to use this herbicide application because it's expensive and time consuming and sometimes delaying the tree removal in the block. So we started doing trials in 2019 and um, continued last year. This first trial was done in WAPTO. Um, in collaboration with Garrett Bishop from GS Long, as well as Ricardo from the Tree Fruit Research Commission. He's an intern there. Um, these were being on Gisla 12, and we did six different treatments in this block. 
We were comparing a grower standard, which was just applying the glyphosate to that cut stump, concentrating on the cambium area and going across that whole cut stump, and comparing that to two um, dilute applications. So a 50-50 of water to glyphosate that was applied either with or without an ammonium and surfactant product in order to help uptake of that <clears throat> glyphosate into the tree. In this first site, we saw very little glyphosate injury to adjoining trees. You can see just these two branches with a little bit of intervenal chlorosis. That was all of the herbicide injury we got from all of our treatments, which was a little bit sad. We thought, oh my goodness, nothing worked. But that could be for two reasons. One, these were Giesla rootstocks, so a smaller rootstock or it could be also that there was less irrigation in this block after um, the harvest, which could have reduced the amount of mobility into those root systems. We looked at root death from our treatments by measuring root death from 10 small roots, so less than 10 millimeter, and five large roots from 10 to 30 millimeter. And in this block, we looked at them the following spring the best treatment was that frill dilute application where we were applying about, uh, where we were applying five mils to four cuts that were notched in those trees. And, but we still didn't have really great root death. It was around 30% in that best treatment. You can see here when you look at the roots from that frill dilute treatment that we have death of the cambium, that layer right underneath the bark, sort of browny orange color in some of the roots, but not all of them. And there's quite a bit of variability from tree to tree um, and treatment to treatment in this site. At Bray's Landing, we were most interested in that frill dilute application, which remember was done by notching the tree and applying a dilute application. So we, we tried that again. The grower wanted to see, does it matter if it's dilute or not? So we looked at that um, dilute application compared to a concentrate application, drilling holes in the tree every four inches around the circumference of the tree and either adding four mils of dilute or two mils of concentrate to every hole. So we ended up adding about a half an ounce of AI to each tree if they were calibrated to a 30 inch circumference tree. At this site, we saw relatively low amount of herbicide injury as well. We had three adjacent trees out of 53 that had moderate herbicide injury, and those were all in the dilute um, application. But this was just yellowing. We had no death or um, severe herbicide injury in adjoining trees. At this site, the trees were stumped four weeks after application, um, and then we we looked at the root systems this fall, so five months after application. You can see that we had 97 to 100 percent root death at this site in both the frill dilute and the frill concentrate application. You can see that nice root death in these um, roots that we evaluated see the orange to brown of that cambium layer right underneath the bark, indicating that those roots were um, dead and were going to continue to completely die over time. The third site was down in Zilla. These applications were done in August. These were Santina on Giesla. And here we were comparing the cut stump treatment to a frill dilute application. The cut stump treatment was done by adding 20 mils of glyphosate um, painted on to the surface of that stump immediately after cutting. And, and then the frill dilute application um, was dr holes drilled every three inches around the circumference of that tree, a three eighths inch drill bit, and um, adding four mils of glyphosate per hole, ending up with a total of one ounce per uh, tree in the frill dilute of AI and two ounces in the um, cut stump treatment if we were to calibrate that to a 30 inch tree. At this site, we also saw 
um, very little, actually, no herbicide injury of adjoining trees. This could be because these were Gisla 12, and this is a trend we're seeing where these smaller rootstocks seem to have less root grafting and perhaps less potential then for both the virus or, or phytoplasma or the glyphosate to move to those adjoining trees. We rated root death at this site at four and eight weeks. This graph is from four weeks where the frill dilute application did a little bit better than the 100% um, application rate. We had about 48% root death at four weeks and that went up to 56% in the frill dilute application um, by that eight week mark. The last site was down in Quincy. We wanted to do an application in September, which is obviously the easiest time for you guys to be doing these applications after harvest and see if we'd still be effective that late in the year. So at this site, we just compared two treatments to a no treatment control. The um, cut stump treatment um, to the frill dilute application here we held the amount of AI steady at about one ounce per 30 inch tree for both of those treatments. At this site, we had um, some herbicide injury to adjoining trees. Now we're, these were mazard, Skeena on mazard, so a, a larger rootstock, more prone to root grafting. We had two adjoining trees in the cut stump and one in the frill treatment that showed quite severe, so death of those adjoining trees from that herbicide. We also had some um, problems in some of the control trees, which were likely due to Pseudomonas um, from previous infections. But when we look at root death at this site, both at four and eight weeks, we had really quite low root death, about 20% in the best treatment. So at least at a fall evaluation period, um, we were not getting very good herbicide transfer to those root systems um, at that timing. And you can see these roots look really quite healthy still um, in most of the trees and roots at this site. So how does this change our our application methods and recommendations for tree removal. Well, the main thing is still to get rid of those symptomatic and um, diseased trees. Those are the source of the pathogen. We wanna get them out of there as quickly as possible. So make sure to be scouting and marking those trees. However, in addition to treating those vectors before tree removal, when you're thinking about your glyphosate applications, here's a couple of things to keep in mind. One is timing. So both the May and August timing seem to do qu quite well for root death. The other is method. That frill application method, either by notching or drilling, did seem to do better across all of the trials and statistically better in most of them. The other is rate. So we probably started out with too low of a rate in um, the, some of the sites. And so making sure we have more than an ounce per 30 inch tree is probably gonna be where we wanna go. And we'll have to do some rate trials to really figure that out. The other thing is rootstock. So this seems to be most important on mazard or large rootstocks where you have more potential for root grafting um, and more likelihood that the pathogen has moved to adjoining trees and that the glyphosate is gonna show you that those trees need to be removed. So with that, thank you very much and thank you to our funders, the Tree Fruit Research Commission and the WSU Tree Fruit Endowment. And please make sure to check out our resources at treefruit.wsu.edu as well as our recorded presentations. Thanks and have a good day.